Hello, I'm Luke Mazzoi from the YFS team and today I'm joined by Ferg and George and we'll be discussing Giffnick's open letter to the SFA and SYFA about the potential of summer football. So Ferg, starting with you, why did the club decide to write this open letter? Well, as with everything we do, uh, you know, we were dictated to by trying to offer you know, the best quality experience to our young players. Uh, we've got over a thousand young players uh, at Giffnick Soccer Centre and we just felt like, as with all community footballers, uh, they'd really felt the effects of lockdown. Uh, it's been well documented, the physical and mental health impacts of not being able to play community sport. Uh, and they're really aware of the need for a collaborative effort to really get the kids back playing football in a way that doesn't didn't leave anyone behind and that maximised the opportunity that we've got coming up over the summer. And there was a real concern amongst our committee that there wasn't that le level of planning or collaboration that's required to really to do that job properly. So what we said, what we thought as a com committee was rather than uh, moan from the sidelines, we'll, we'll get together some thoughts of, about practically how as a football community we could uh, put things right. Hence the letter that we sent to the SYFA and SFA. And actually, if you read it, it's, it's, uh, it is practical, but effectively, in essence, it's calling for uh, a very concrete plan to get kids back the lost time they've had from lockdown uh, and to maximise uh, the next few months to ensure that as much football uh, is played as possible. But also, there was a, there was a kind of broader point uh, born out of this experience that there probably isn't a level of transparency uh, that's required from uh, a fully functioning governing body. So we took the opportunity as well to, to make that point. We felt that level of consultation uh, and lobbying actually uh, wasn't there and really needs, and needs to be put in place in the years ahead so we could look back at lockdown as the opportunity for you know, a restart for the community game because the SFA are the first to tell us about the importance of football, which we totally agree with. So we need a, a collaborative effort to make sure we're maximising the potentials in the community. Yeah, and George, is there anything you'd like to add to the proposed restructuring? Yeah, I think Ferg's laid it out um, fairly well. I think in addition to actually getting us back playing football, which is what everyone wants, no one is really going to argue with that, I guess... <laughs> Uh, this last year or so we've had with, with COVID affecting anyone trying to play any sort of football, not just community football, but I think in particular the, the sort of grassroots game, which is a lifeblood and feeds into the senior game ultimately, um, has sort of been overlooked. And I think uh, as a, one of the largest community clubs out there, we're, we're conscious that maybe our voices aren't really being properly heard because there's certainly a lot of frustration we've detected out there about the updates we're getting, the news we're getting, there's a lack of specification. It's all quite vague. We know it's a difficult job, but where's the consultation? Um, couldn't they actually, you know, speak to the grassroots clubs, be more transparent, as Ferg suggested? If there are issues, tell us what they are. Don't hide them from us, because that, that only leads to frustration, particularly when there's this desperation to get back playing. So it, it's really, it's a, a, a plea for them to actually help and work with us because I think we're all willing to do it. At the end of the day, the, the, the grassroots community is mostly made up of volunteers. We're not in paid positions, but, it, you know, word gets out there fairly quickly and, you know, people are willing to help. People know what's going on. The frustrations uh, seem to echo in a vacuum of a lack of proper communication and virtually no consultation so is this not the perfect opportunity to to do something about that and get everyone pulling in the one direction and indeed to, to look at something like summer football where taking account of our climate the number of games that get cancelled over the winter season can we not actually think together and try and do something positive for the game in scotland yeah and just to you first this time george when did you start think about producing this letter and when did you first take action? I guess we, we regularly meet as a committee so I, I guess 
with you know we're all on social media we all speak to coaches at other clubs um no, nobody could really meet <laughs> in in person so you know a lot of the information you get it comes from the zoom calls we were having and picking up with players on zoom sessions you're having parents um other coaches social media generally um and we're all waiting with bated breath after the government announcements say they came out on a monday or a tuesday you'd sort of expect the sfa would maybe come out on a wednesday or the or the thursday at latest with how that can be interpreted for football because they sit in the 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 grg the, the the group that actually decides a lot of this but sometimes it was taking weeks and then whatever did come out seemed to be purely repeating something but put, putting in details there which were not easily understood and then had to be interpreted reinterpreted clarified with them so you know the communication is not where it really needs to be um because everyone was wanting to know asap you know if you, you could play for the next three weeks and they knew that just tell us that if they weren't absolutely aware you know tell us what they are aware of <laughs> and then specify what they can't tell us uh, but you know the communication it was just increasing frustration, I think, within the, the community. Uh, and it seemed to be focused more on what we can't do than what it might be possible to try and do or what the big picture is. And the big picture was maybe lost sight of in all of this. Yeah, so Ferg, do you think that the topic of summer football would have come up if it, that second lockdown hadn't occurred? I think it's highly unlikely. I mean, it seems to be one of those ambient issues that just kind of floats along without anyone really kind of harnessing it. Uh, and it's maybe slightly counterintuitive, but this is a good, an opportunity, a good example of some good coming out of the lockdown. That it, it has given us pause for thought and an opportunity to look at how we do things better. I think the other point to be made is this: you know, we've, we've actually got a small window of opportunity to make this work. When we at Giffnick talk about summer football, we're not talk, talking just about our club, and this was reflected in the letter. We're talking about a strategic plan which uh, takes every single youth player uh, with a plan, i.e. nobody is left behind. So a lot of players who suffer social isolation that have been disproportionately affected by lockdown. And we know a lot of community clubs are on the verge of folding, which is hugely uh, worrying. So that's why actually you know, we feel if the SYFA or SFA aren't able to deal with this, it's of such importance that the Scottish Government actually should be taking a keen interest in making this happen. Early indications suggest that, and this is what we feared, that there's a kind of a patchwork of uh, different solutions offered by the league. So they're basically being left to, to work it themselves. And of course, that's difficult because they, the big variable in, in this is uh, facilities. So local authorities need to be brought on board uh, to make this happen. Uh, you know, the original response we received uh, from the SYFA suggested, for example, insurance may be an issue. And okay, there's some low level barriers, but uh, we don't believe that without, uh, we believe with sound planning, we can overcome those issues. But uh, early indications suggest that there's not that kind of joined up plan that we need. So the next stage for us is going to be uh, seeking or taking up the offers of political support we find to try and raise the stakes in this and escalate it to something that's actually of national importance. Huge amount of le electioneering going on at the moment. That's about community sport and physical mental health of our young people at the forefront of it. Yeah, I mean, football's just one aspect of that, but, you know, football is probably, without doubt, the most popular sport and it's got the, the largest participation um, from youth in Scotland. So if we can take a lead, we, I mean, by no means do we say football's more important than anything else. It is obviously to us as coaches, it feels that way. But this is about getting kids back active who, for the best part of a year, haven't been allowed to, to meet, congregate, get onto pitches at all. We're now steadily, you know, hopefully coming out of this lockdown. But where's the planning? Where's the work? Where are we? And we don't doubt that people are doing work, but it would be nice to hear what it is, uh, to see if they could garner support. Uh, we could form, you know, a consensus view of what the best way forward is. I mean, there have been arg arguments perennially about 
should we be playing summer football? Is it necessary that the, the you know the, the junior and grassroots football seasons uh, are sort of delineated alongside the the senior seasons? So you're you're off for the summer. Summers are probably our best months to play football, particularly for kids. So you know, let's think about that. We you know let's not get into the, the old thinking of it, it's been done this way before, so it needs to be done that way and we can't actually assess the new things. This is the opportunity to look at it because if we can change that period of time, we'll actually have people playing more football or doing more sport, which is surely what we want, particularly after effectively 12 months of inactivity. You know, kids getting addicted to their Xboxes or whatever. You know, and that's that's difficult. It's a real thing out there, and the, 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 you know that the isolation and the the mental well being that that goes hand in hand with that lack of you know meeting people outdoor sport physical activity. It, you know, Scottish government are clearly concerned about that as well. So it's not just the football authorities, other sporting authorities. We all I think want the same thing. We want better and more participation in sport. So let's talk about it. Let's not sit in our hands here while this opportunity is actually there. Yeah, and George, you just touched on the fact that a lot of youngsters have missed physical activity. How damaging do you think lockdown has been for these young people? I mean, it's difficult for me to say as, you know, I'm not an expert, but it's quite clear, even seeing some of the other guys coming back, that, you know, the, the slight changes in the personality. And, you know, we're, we're lucky. The people that you can get along to training are, I suppose, still involved. But, you know, you do hear reports out there of kids who just strayed away from football. And it'll be the same for other sports. That's not surprising when, to me, there's nothing obvious that's been done that you can produce and demonstrate to these kids that we were all keen to get them back. And where's the action to show that interest in getting them back? And, they're, you know, their problem ages with the, the young to mids middle-aged teenagers drifting away from the game. If you can't play the game you love for the best part of 12 months, you're going to find something else to do. You know, where's the priority being given to this? I, as an adult who's actually involved and keep myself educated on where things actually are in football, which is not the easiest thing in the world to do, for the reasons we've talked about, I'm not sure. <laughs> you know, I'm not I'm not sure if, if, if I were a kid, even with that level of knowledge that I'd be keen to return to the game. I, you know, I'd need somebody actually, you know, that I could trust and respect who's fighting my corner to get me playing. And that's down to basically individual coaches of individual teams and clubs at the end of the day. And they don't seem to get any say in the decisions that are made. Yeah. Fair is there anything you'd like to add to that? Similar to George, I mean, anecdotally, uh, you know, I, in addition to committee duties, uh, share head coach duties with our 2010 groups so of 54 boys and girls. And I have noticed uh, with them coming back, you know, their shortfall in fitness, you notice the, the decline in physical fitness. Uh, and just through talking to the kids, you can appreciate just how much they have missed playing. Uh, and I'm conscious they're the lucky ones, and that's the kind of point I would go back to, that we, you know, we're able to bring kids back. We've got scale that we can offer, you know, a good good amount of football, but really conscious of the kids and clubs that are, aren't able to come back. I mean, for example, we benefit from our own facilities, uh, and I've been able to use that during some of the lockdown, but, you know, that's... And indicate, I think that's another sign of why this kind of overarching strategy is so important. Uh, and when I mean, we talk, you know, we're out in the community a lot talking to, to community partners. Uh, and you can't help but notice the, the real kind of concern out there for, for the health impacts and how we can get together to address it. And, you know, it's been described, I mean, community football, for my money, is the most underused network in Scotland, bar none. In terms of an audience of people who are really well connected to coaches and clubs on a regular basis, uh, and you you know you guys do a good job in terms of uh, you know playing back some of the concerns, but you know there needs to be so much more done to to really uh, engage with that group 
and use it as a force for for good. And this yeah, it's needed now more than ever, you know. Yeah, and just when you're speaking about summer football, back a bit. Um, do you think that summer football is something that can be here to stay permanently? Well, do you know what? I've been asked that question. The honest answer is, what better year to use it as a test bed? You know, there's, I don't. I'm not suggesting it's it's the it's the cure all, but let's run it as a test this uh, summer and make it universal so everyone gets access to it. And again, in a collaborative way, let's bring together different facets of the community game together with the governing bodies and the government for that matter and review it. I mean, any other organisation uh, with responsibility for this number of people, a member's organisation would be kind of driven to do, obliged to do that. So that's the way to do it. Let's run this as a test. Personally, I think there's huge benefits to be gained from it. Uh, and, you know, I think it's it's a, it's a great opportunity for to test it. But I think some measure of summer football, you know, would be a ter terrific thing in the in the years, years ahead. Let, let's try it and see. Um, for me personally, and it's not about uh, personal views, but I can see a lot of pros and benefits. I see very little cons. I know that you know barriers such as facilities keep keep on getting thrown up, but you know let's try and address that. You know the facilities aren't packing up and going on holiday; they're still there at the end of the day. Um, what what the difference is for me is that the weather is such that you know you're going to get ninety percent plus a games on in the summer seasons, as opposed to twenty five thirty sometimes more percent of games off in the winter seasons. So. You know, if you were starting from scratch and you'd never played football before, when when would you choose the season to be? What's optimal for participation? You know, the grass is even growing in the summer. So you're going to do less damage to it by playing on it than you are in the winter. So I'm, I'm yet really to hear a convincing argument that winter is better than summer. The, the argument seems to be that's what the senior leagues do. You know, why doesn't that change? For me, actually, our senior league should maybe think about changing as well and get in line with some of the Scandinavian. But, you know, I'll leave that argument for another day. I'm more concerned about, you know, kids' football. Yeah, and just talking about summer football and about the governing bodies, what sort of response would you like to see for them, from them, sorry, if you do decide to take the player to them? Well, I'll give you a, uh, yeah, I'll give you an update where we are with them. Uh, we have obviously sent a letter to both organisations. We've had initial responses, uh, and we've had a, a a commitment to meet this Thursday evening. So we're going to do that. What I would say is uh, we're concerned in the basis of the initial responses that we've had that there's a focus more on the barriers than the solutions. Yeah. And that's very much a point that we were making to them on Thursday, albeit with a recognition that. Uh, you know, they've been working under difficult conditions and I don't doubt they've got the, the best interests of the game at heart, but that's not uh, not to miss the, the key point that we need to to, to take this one on. Uh, so but that's that'll be the focus on our with the focus on our discussions on Thursday that let's think about the solutions, let's not focus on the barriers and let's bring in the people that we need to 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 find this universal solution. And first and foremost, for me, that means local authorities. Let's not be worrying about facilities. It's, and it may it may require a level of investment to do this. You know, you know, facilities need staff, staff need to be paid. So again, that's where the Scottish government potentially can come in and, and uh, as they have done in a lot of different sectors, uh, cognizant of the, the mental health, the physical health benefits to give some, something back to young people with money well spent. So that's the kind of practical issues that we're going to be raising with on Thursday night. And we've had really positive soundings from our local uh, MP, for example, who's keen to to, to support us with, uh, you know, with, with that as well. There, there does seem to be an initiative that the SFA have just put in social media recently uh, to try and convince the government to support the game. And there's references in there to Hamden and there's a lack of specification. We'd like to find out yeah. more about that because Absolutely. I guess the, the principle behind it we're certainly supportive of. We want to make sure that the grassroots element of that is is frankly to the, the, the forefront. 
as opposed to an afterthought, which I think all too often it seems to be that senior football leads it. At the end of the day, senior football typically are commercial businesses that have to look after themselves. Most of community football is run by volunteers, it's got charities, status, etc. It needs support if anyone needs support. And without that, there is no senior football in a few years' time. So, you know, let's make sure that grassroots has a voice in developing whatever strategy you've got there as well. Speak to the people on the ground who know what they're doing. Um, some of the rulings that were coming out, for example, the recent one, it, again, it leads to frustration that could be avoided if you get the communication right of the numbers of, of kids that could train together. It just didn't seem to be cognizant of how grassroots football works, how many kids you've got in a squad, how you hire out pitches. It was talking about a quarter of a pitch. When nobody has a quarter of a pitch, it's usually a minimum of a third of a pitch. If you go into social media amongst the grassroots teams, that was a massive area of frustration to the, the point where it completely undermines any feeling of respect of or authority felt towards our governing bodies. You know, when that's, and you know, I'm not saying they made that decision, but we need to know how that decision was made so that we can avoid decisions like that in the future. When the logic suggests that you can have 52 kids on a pitch when you're training in quarters of bubbles of 13 or more, but if you increased that and took account a third of a pitch, you could have less numbers to accommodate squads, but that isn't allowed. I mean, I'd, I've seen no acknowledgement from the, the governing bodies that, that 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 maybe should have been different, but I tell you what, there's no one within grassroots that thinks that was a sensible decision, and nobody seems to understand why that has been made. If there's good reasons, tell us. You know, just tell us. Yeah, and just before we wrap up, George, what? Well, sorry. How can other clubs join Giffnick in seeking this bid for restructuring of youth football? That's, that's a great question because the, the one thing the committee uh, emphasises this is not about Giffnick really, but somebody has to put their heads over the above the parapet. So we decided stuff it. Let, let's do it ourselves. We had a I worked with a couple of other clubs geographically spread, but for various reasons they couldn't. Um, they couldn't sign up to at that point in time we've had a lot of support i think fed's probably got the numbers at his fingertips of of the clubs that have come and support us whether it's via social media or, or, or wherever else so as far as i'm concerned it's not about giftock's name being there it's about grassroots as a whole coming together because we can't say we speak for grassroots as a whole but you know with a number of coaches we've got out there and you know relationships with other clubs we've got a good feel for where it is and what people think um and we have had significant support so for, for me it's about a grassroots campaign you know if we can <laughs> we can step back because this has got the right people involved speaking with authorities that's great that's great we'll do our job because <laughs> you know it's a big enough job as you're probably aware being a volunteer at a community club to, to get your own club running correctly but so, somebody had to say something because as Ferg said, time is of the essence here. There's a there's a fairly short and shortening window of opportunity to try and make this work. You know, just going to indicate seasons which are some leagues are cancelling them, some are going on. So it's that's inconsistent. That leads to frustration. Let's at least make sure during the summer we've got a bit of clarity and consistency. Just to give an indication, look, I mean, I put up in one of the forums, many forums, I put up. I know what we were doing and asked clubs to send me uh, their logo if they supported what we were about. And we were genuinely inundated by logos. I mean, they were just flying in. Uh, and we've started to create some... If you, if you go into our, uh, social media, you'll see montages of some of the clubs' logos that have support. And they were from throughout Scotland, of all sizes. Yeah. Uh, and that was just one pass. And we've obviously you know, raised the petition as well. So, listen, there's no doubt there's widespread support for it you just have to go on social media go go ask clubs uh the reason it's not really been raised before is just because george mentioned by its nature community football is just fragmented and it's for that reason maybe the governing bodies aren't brought to account in a constructive way in the way they should so i think again this is an opportunity to try and put that right yeah and for the sya is meant to sort of represent i suppose youth football 
I think there's probably a feeling out there that it's maybe time to reappraise how that's done, in what way, you know, um, how they take soundings from from, you know, community football clubs. Yeah. Um, you know, and if there's a genuine sort of discussion that can be framed positively to make that better, that's that's what we're trying to do. We'll never get anything perfect, but we can certainly, I think, get it better than it, than it has been in the past. And this is the opportunity to to have that discussion towards changing things. Yeah, well, Ferg and Joyce, thank you for joining me today. And if you're watching this and want to find out more about the Giffnick's Open Letter, you can find it on our social media. Thank you. Right. Okay, cheers, Luke. See you later. Thank you. Bye.